Okay, so today's theme that we're looking at is growing in discipleship. And these are the aims to understand the essence of discipleship, to know the pitfalls and pressures, and to follow the biblical patterns in our lives. And I'm going to look at 12 different areas. We go through these things relatively quickly, and you'll have the PowerPoint slides afterwards. And also much of what I'm going to say is based on a a booklet called Surviving the Foundation Years, which is a quite short, easy read, published by CMF UK and available on the ICMDA website. And you should have a link to that already to the PDF, which you can download. And discipleship is, is about being followers of Jesus. We're told that the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch in the, in the book of Acts. So disciples are Jesus followers, people who are there to learn from him and to walk in his footsteps by his power, having been saved by him. And the heart of it all is that we recognize who this wonderful person Jesus Christ is. And the New Testament is filled with what we call Christological passages, which unpack him. And then, of course, we have the, the four Gospels, which gives us great detail about his life, his teaching, his miracles, and what he did, and particularly his death and resurrection, by which we can become his uh, followers and have uh, eternal life in him. And we remember what, what he did, that God so loved the world that he sent his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. That's John three sixteen. So Jesus is and was God. He emptied himself, took the form of a human being, as we're told in Philippians 2, became obedient unto death and won us our salvation so that we can enjoy God forever together. And uh, his mission in following him is this mission of, uh, it described in Luke 4, of preaching, healing, deliverance, and justice. So we're going to look at that in a lot more detail in one of the sessions to come. And we know that, that, uh, that history is linear. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And we're heading towards the great consummation, the great ending of all things of the new heaven and the new earth when Jesus Christ returns and establishes his rule. Of course, he's ruling now, but he's still gathering his people. So that's where it all starts and ends with Jesus. And when we think, well, why do we follow Jesus? I, I love the story in Luke 5 of Peter going out and catching nothing and then coming back and Jesus telling him to go out one more time. And, and he does in obedience to Christ. And then, he, of course, he's overwhelmed with this huge uh, catch of fish. And he comes back and says, go away from me, Lord, because I'm a sinful man. He, he realizes the extraordinary power of the Lord. But the same Peter, of course, when Jesus says to him at the end of John 6, after the miracle of the, the bread and the fish and the feeding of the 5,000, when everyone goes away, uh, Jesus says to Peter, will you go away too? And, and Peter says, Lord, to whom will we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we've come to know that you are the Holy One of God. So it's realizing who Jesus is and what he's done and the, res the only proper response to that is to walk in obedience to him. And love and obedience are inextricably linked in the Christian faith. If you love me, you'll obey my commandments, said Jesus. He who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And I'll love him and make my home with him and manifest myself to him. So it's the key to knowing God, to growing deeply in our relationship with God, is obedience. You remember when, when Jesus asked Peter right at the end of John's gospel, do you love me? And Peter says yes three times to the question. And the answer is, well, if you love me, feed my sheep, tend my lambs. It's what we do, loving one another, walking in obedience to, to him. So that's the heart of it. Now, as medical students, junior doctors, uh, junior dentists and so on, we're facing pressures of all kinds, which uh, might be common to all people at our age, the social and psychological pressures, uh, particularly at the, the time that we're in now, but also uniquely the spiritual pressures that other, other doctors and dentists who are not believers don't face, the, the temptations, the fact that we have a real enemy in the devil who's trying to pull us down. 
and we need to be aware of what the pitfalls are, the, the holes that we can fall into. You may wonder why there's a sheep on this slide. Well, I come from a country, New Zealand, where we have about 30 million sheep. There's many of them. So there's lots of stories about sheep. And when I was a young boy, I was climbing in the hills with my brother and some other friends. And we walked into a, a coal mine along a horizontal, uh, sorry, a gold mine along a horizontal shaft. And luckily we had torches because there was a, a hole in the floor of the shaft, which went down for many, many meters. And we lowered ourselves down with ropes to see what was there. And there was a dead sheep at the bottom who had fallen in, wandered in away from the rain and fallen into this deep pit and died. And the sheep made three mistakes. The first one is that the sheep didn't walk in the light. It, it went into the darkness where it couldn't see what it was doing. And walking in the light is walking according to God's word, his light, his uh, word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our paths. The second mistake he made was that he didn't keep in fellowship. He got split off from the other sheep and didn't stay with the flock. He went off alone. And the third mistake he made is that he did not know the pitfalls. He did not know that there was a, a deep pit in this mine shaft. And so he met his end. So walking in the light, keeping fellowship, knowing the pitfalls is hugely important for us to see the dangers before they arrive. So I'm now just going to go very quickly through a number of points which I've found personally very helpful for me in my junior doctor years and are still very, very important now. And uh, number one is your relationship with God. Maintain your devotional life. And the scriptures are absolutely central in this. Uh, Moses said to Joshua, this, the book of the law will not depart out of your mouth, but be careful to, to live uh, according to it and uh, make sure you obey it, he, he said. And we know that the, the Bible is, is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for correction, reproof and training in righteousness and so we need to be sure that we are constantly and continually drawing upon it to make space for daily bible study uh, listening reading meditation memory uh, and so on to keep us on the right path to pray of course but to pray constantly so that the the christian life is a, a life of constant prayer remember nehemiah's prayer right in the middle of a conversation with the king and Paul's exhortation to pray constantly. The importance of singing and praise. Why is the Bible so full of psalms and hymns? Why are they such an important part of our worship? It's because they uh, embrace and remind us of the, the truths of, of Scripture in a way that's wonderfully memorable. Reading and study um, of the Scriptures and not to let our reading and study uh, over, overcome all our other time. Uh, Rick Paul, who was uh, until recently the regional secretary for ICMDA of, of Western Europe or the whole European Eurasia region, uh, said you can read one book many times or many books one time. And of course, we know the one book many times that he was talking about. And, and I've I learned that lesson thankfully early because I had some very good role models and just making reading through the Bible uh, every year uh, and studying it in more depth uh, provides such stability to our Christian lives. And keep short accounts with God. In other words, you know, we, we will always be falling short. We'll always be sinning and failing in various ways. But we confess our sins and come back to him and look for cleansing. Number two, maintain fellowship with others. So the coals in the fire, if you take one coal out of a fire and put it on the hearth, it will very quickly go out but coals in a fire together will keep each other burning and in the same way it's our support of uh, other christians who stir up and encourage us to love and good works uh, and we work, have to work much harder at it of course in times of uh, pandemic when meeting together is not uh, possible in the same way i went out this morning for breakfast with a, a fellow christian leader just a, a time of sharing and mutual encouragement so important. Finding a church where uh, we can get 
well fed and and have brothers and sisters who uphold us but also a place that understands why it is that we're not there every weekend and can't attend every home group and understands the pattern of our work and is able to support us in that to be involved in christian ministry there is not much time when you're a junior doctor or dentist but just to do one thing i think is really helpful i got involved in my first year in a new city working as a junior doctor with leading a youth group and it just gave me one evening a week where i could have some output and be involved and it's uh, christian ministry really helps to sustain us as we're giving to others god gives to us and then of course time for family and friends again more difficult now but you've got to make a, a priority of it um, perhaps never so important as when we can't meet together my family is in new zealand and we cannot visit easily we thankfully can phone and so i have a regular time every week on a sunday morning where i'll phone first my brother and then uh, my mother and speak to to each of them we, we've got to work on keeping those relationships going sharing our faith st francis of assisi is famous for saying i share my faith with everyone i meet and sometimes i use words and of course the witness of our lives is very important but um, of course we have to use words as well uh, it's not just about our actions or our lives will just be uninterpreted parable to people and so paul the apostle prayed for opportunities because he he realized it was a spiritual battle and that god opened the door and gave opportunities learning to ask good searching questions are you interested in spiritual things do you have a faith that helps you at times like this being able to explain in simple words what the message of the gospel is and how to answer the questions that come back inevitably as a result of that and we'll be looking at that a little bit more in one of the later sessions living with integrity a good reputation is uh, incredibly precious and Daniel we know was a man who we're told worked at a very high level not just in Babylon but in media and Persia in living through the reign of several kings and several empires but we're told about Daniel in Daniel 6 4 in the lion's den chapter that he was uh, he was not uh, negligent and that he was a man of uh, integrity and that he could be relied upon and people will not pay attention to our words if we don't pay attention to our work and be sure that we're doing it as an act of worship unto the lord as if we were serving him himself and there are some very difficult bosses you'll work with in medicine uh, i i trained in general surgery and i had some pretty difficult bosses but we we have to think that we serve them as if they were jesus however they treat us we we live and serve them as if we are living for for jesus what's your lifestyle uh, number five keep good company first corinthians fifteen thirty three says bad company destroys good morals and it's incredibly important the people we spend time with because we will become uh, like those people we need to make time in our lives to spend with people who are going to build us up and encourage us of course we need to be reaching out to others but it is very easy to be led astray by the wrong kind of company the whole christian walk the whole christian life is a life of repentance it's not just turning from sin at the beginning when we become believers and accept christ but every day is in, uh, made up of many many decisions where we could decide to turn towards sin or turn away do i click the mouse over this image knowing where it will take me do i you know do i do i linger um you know at night when i should be getting sleep watching something uh un unfruitful and so on we all know the ways in which we are tempted and one of the particular sins i think of of doctors and dentists is complaining and gossip i think this is particularly endemic in the united kingdom where i live now but it is so easy to 
uh, in the wrong group of friends uh, when one is tired to start complaining and to be gossiping about other people who are not there. Our speech is incredibly important. Uh, I, I read uh, the Bible every morning with my executive assistant here at, at ICMDA, Josh Mills. Many of you will know Josh. And every day, we, we, even though we're living 50 miles apart now during the pandemic, we connect every day and we start off but just by praying. We read a passage of scripture. We take turns to speak about it one after the other. And then we, you know, we pray and then we talk about the issues of, of the day. And we have both found it incredibly encouraging. And this morning it was James 3, interestingly, because uh, it's on this slide. And James 3, 1, which is about those who teach being judged with far greater strictness, which I think is one of the most frightening verses in, in the Bible. Uh, but it goes on to talk about how important what, how we use our tongues is that we use them to build people up and not knock them down. Get adequate food and rest, very practical. But Jesus, we're told in Luke 5, 15 and 16, after he'd been active preaching and healing, we're told he often went off to lonely places and prayed. So he made time to be alone with his father as the son of God and recognize the importance of that. And he used uh, meal times and, and rest as, as a great time to build up the disciples and spend time with them. Do we, do we put aside time to have meals in the company of others and uh, have fellowship there? That's the challenge. The picture in this, in this slide is uh, one, a picture I took in Israel on the top of Mount Carmel, and that's a statue of Elijah, uh, killing the prophets of Baal. You remember the story there. And of course, Elijah had this amazing battle with the prophets of Baal and God sent fire from heaven and burnt up the ox and the water and the trough and, and so on. And, but in the very next chapter, we find him uh, afraid, alone, uh, running away and terrified about what's going to happen to him, particularly at the hands of the evil king, uh, the evil queen Jezebel. And uh, it's a beautiful picture of how God picks up people when they're burnt out and broken, as we can often be in medical or dental practice when the pressures are great. And the first thing God does is to give him food and rest, very practical. And then he builds them up with a fresh filling of his spirit and leads them on to the next thing. So rest is important. And uh, though all of us will find different activities restful. But the question, what is your restful activity? What is it that builds you up? Make time for it in your life. And then learning to handle loneliness, because uh, it is one of the difficulties and temptations when we are working very long hours away from home and family and our usual supports, that we can be lonely and be tempted in those situations. And I've, I've found these principles particularly helpful that God promises first of all to us that he'll never leave us nor forsake us that nothing can take us from his hand and that um, nothing can ever separate us from his love so that we know we're always in the presence of God however lonely we may feel for human company and to learn to rest in him we're told that David in one of the most difficult moments of his life in 1 Samuel, when raiders had come and kidnapped his wives and taken away uh, everything from the town in which they lived and his own men were wanting to kill him, we found that he, he rested and found his strength in God. And uh, loneliness, God never exposes us to these things without a reason for it. And one of the reasons is, I believe, that in learning how to handle it ourselves, we can then be a comfort and encouragement to others who are facing it. That's the message of 2 Corinthians 1, being friends to others, keeping in touch with people. And I trained a long time ago before the days of email and texts and the kind of technology we had now and really all we could do was to write letters even long distance phone calls were very expensive but it was the letters of friends that sustained me 
during that uh, difficult time and, and used me to help to encourage others as well. And it's, it's uh, beautiful when you look at Paul's letters, right at the end of each one, generally, there is a list of names that he asked people to, to, uh, to greet or who send their greetings. And in Romans, at the end of that book, there's a whole list of over 20 people who he's met who were living in Rome. And the amazing thing was that Paul had never ever even visited Rome at that point in his life. And yet he, he knew a lot of people who lived there because he, in traveling around, made friendships with people and then he kept in touch with them and encouraged them. Building relationships. The man who made friends was the man who was sacked by his master and uh, he let all his uh, master's debtors off their debts, reduced them in size. And so when he was thrown out, he, he had lots of friends to go to who would support him when he was jobless. And uh, Jesus says, you know, we should learn the lesson from this, that it's important to uh, build friendships and you've used the resources that we have to, to do that, perhaps not in the way this particular man did, but to make time for individuals. We know Jesus was very busy in his ministry. And yet the Gospels are full of long one-to-one -one encounters that he, he had. Just think of chapters John, uh, John chapters three to, three to five. You've got Nicodemus in chapter three. You've got the woman of Samaria in chapter four. You've got the man by the pool of Siloam who he healed in John five. And each of those is a long one-to-one -one encounter. Um, one of the difficulties, of course, of the COVID thing is that we have to really work on that. It's difficult to build new relationships. And it's best, of course, done one-to-one -one because the intimacy of sharing is far greater. And it's, it's that kind of intimacy that builds trust and builds relationships, which are there for the, the tough times. Paul knew people's names. He asked questions about them. He, he uh, told us to give to those who cannot give back building relationships. And then uh, managing our time. Now you've probably seen this illustration before. This is a jar and in it there are rocks, uh, big rocks and there are small stones and then there is sand. And uh, this is meant to illustrate our lives. So uh, the jar is your life and the space in the jar is all the time you have. And the stones and rocks and sand are the activities which fill that jar. And the rocks, the, the biggest things, are the most important things in our lives, the things that only we can do, our relationship with God, our relationship with our husband and wife, children, parents, our close friends, uh, also our, our study uh, and our work. And there is enough time for all of these things in our lives if we make a priority of them. And then the stones are the other sorts of activities that, that we do the things we we fill up our lives with recreational things resting and so on and then the sand is that kind of stuff that is uh, there's always room for sand in your life but uh, only for a certain amount of it it's what can easily expand to fill that uh, time and of course the lesson is that if you put the rocks in first and then put the stones in second then you've got plenty of room for some sand. But if you fill your life up with sand, you'll find that the most important things get left out and then your life is not in balance. And it's a good question to ask ourselves frequently, what is the sand in our lives? You know, what are the things we do where we can easily waste time that then mean that we haven't got time for those things that are really important? You know, what is it? I'll just leave that question with you. So guarding your devotional life, we've talked about already. Mark 1.35 uh, says that early in the morning, Jesus got up and went out to pray. So he gave the, the very best hours of his day to uh, his reading of the scriptures, listening to God, praying to him. And Luke 5, as we've seen, going off to lonely places to uh, be alone with God because he recognized he needed that. And if the son of God needed it, how much do we need it? Don't let others' expectations control you. So Jesus, even with his own family, when they had uh, expectations upon him to take him away from the things that were most important, he resisted that. 
it's so easy to, be, to become the product of other people's decisions mm -hmm. rather than taking control and setting our own priorities. And Jesus was very clear in his priorities. We're told uh, this last passage, Mark 1, 36 to 38, is after he gets up in the morning. His disciples then come and find him. And he says, well, I must go to the villages and preach because that's why I've been sent. So he knew what he was on the planet for and he made sure that he fulfilled that. And as his disciples, we're called to do the same. Manage your money. As, as a medical student, a dental student, you have uh, lots of time and no money. And uh, as, a, as a doctor, you have lots of money and no time. But what we do with our money will determine the direction of our lives. Where your treasure is, your heart will be also, Jesus said. That's just a fact. And the things we spend our money on, we will spend our time on, and our hearts will be there as well. And I'm very thankful when I was a junior doctor, my registrar, who was um, a couple of years ahead of me on the surgical ward, was a, a Christian disciple who was planning to go and he as a way as a missionary with his wife they went and worked in Nepal for many years as a missionary surgeon and he said learn to live as a missionary now and don't go into debt save up to buy things don't go into debt to buy them uh, because then you won't be controlled by your debts and you'll always have enough to give away and to spend on those things that are, are really valuable in the kingdom and i'm very grateful for that because it meant that we made a number of decisions early to to live simply and live well within our means and then have money left both to be able to give away and invest in god's kingdom but also to supply our own needs uh, save and we need to save for various times in our lives you know for for study for retirement for uh, assisting our children and so on but we need to have a reason for doing it and we need to do it in a way that is uh, ethical uh, number 11 we're nearly there then uh, now so know where you stand on ethical issues on lifestyle issues daniel and his friends were asked to eat the king's diet they felt that was wrong for them as believers and they drew a line and they didn't cross that line they resisted it and then later on we saw that they could withstand the the fiery furnace and the lion's den as well and we need to be very clear what lines we will not cross both in our lifestyle choices but also in our ethical choices as doctors as well you know i i will, I will never take a patient's life i'll never uh, carry out an abortion i i will not drink to the extent that I'll, i get drunk and lose control and so on we've, we've got to have these these lines that we don't cross and think of the apostles who when they were told to stop preaching the gospel they said we serve god and not men they they respected human authorities but they recognized they had limits and uh, so the lord tells us to stand firm and then finally ask for help frequently the Christian life is not a life for soloists. We're not called uh, to follow Christ individually, but we're called to come into his church, a wonderfully diverse group of people of different ethnicities, cultures, backgrounds, gifts, personalities, weaknesses, and so on, because each one of us needs each other one in order to carry out our lives we are called to be interdependent to help one another and uh, we think of nehemiah's prayer we looked at that a few uh, weeks ago didn't we nehemiah 6 9 building the wall and he says god strengthen my hands he recognized that he was weak jehoshaphat when attacked by the foreign army recognized he said we don't know what to do god but our eyes upon you and Paul talked about God's strength being made perfect in weakness. And we are weak people who need God's help in everything. And often that help is, comes through other human beings. And I can tell you, as both as a junior doctor and one who's been uh, you know, running 
award and taking more responsibility that the best uh, the best juniors, the best trainees are those who know their limits and who will ask for help when they get into trouble, but won't try and um, go on alone when they don't know what they're doing. And it's interesting that, that Paul should say, bear one another's burdens, remember how the verse finishes, and so fulfill the law of Christ, that bearing one another's burdens is a beautiful picture of what the Christian life is all about. So there we are, uh, that's um, a quick jaunt through the whole issue of, um, of growing in discipleship in a medical context. Oh, yeah.